You may have seen reports of barges and cargo ships hitting bridges. There are risks in maritime transportation. Hi, this is Bill Federer. And in this episode of How We Got Here, we're going to look at the unique history of powered sea vessels and risks associated with them. Did you know that 80 to 90 percent of world's goods are transported by sea and waterways? Globally, that is approximately 11 billion tons of goods transported each year on some 60,000 commercial merchant ships, tankers, and maritime vessels managed by some 1.2 million seafarers. But there are risks, such as pirate attacks, like Houthis of Yemen firing missiles on ships headed to the Suez Canal. Risks can be from accidents. ABC News reported May 15, 2024, barge hits a bridge in Texas, damaging the structure, causing an oil spill. The Associated Press reported on March 30, 2024, the Oklahoma State Patrol closed a highway south of Salazar after a barge struck a bridge over the Arkansas River. Associated Press reported March 26, 2024, Baltimore Bridge collapses after cargo ship rams into support columns, destroying the span in a matter of seconds and plunging it into the river in a terrifying collapse. A new risk is that of cyber attacks as navigation computers and software on ships are often outdated and vulnerable to sophisticated data leaks, ransomware, and hacking, which can potentially take control of the ship's throttle and rudder. This was highlighted in an Obama-produced Netflix movie, Leave the World Behind. Fox News reported March 27, 2024, Baltimore Bridge Collapse draws comparisons to Obama-produced film about cargo ship cyber attacks. Seafaring trade has existed from the invention of the sailboat in Egypt around 3500 BC. Wind has been the primary power moving sea vessels. This changed with the Industrial Revolution of the 18th century. England used coal to heat homes. The mining of coal was an important industry, but mines would fill up with water. In 1712, Thomas Newcomen designed a mechanism to pump water out of mines using a cylinder raised by hot steam, then lowered by cool mist on a repeating cycle, but it was inefficient. In 1769, James Watt, the son of Scottish Presbyterian Covenanters, significantly improved the design by having a separate cylinder for the cool air and shutoff valves. Watt's fascination with steam power began when he observed a kettle on a stove and saw steam force the lid to rise. Watt patented his double-action steam engine with a rocking beam connected to a flywheel, which rotated in a circular arc. Speed was controlled by an ingenious invention called a centrifugal governor. To measure the power of a steam engine, Watt introduced the measurement of horsepower. One unit of horsepower is equal to a horse lifting 75 kilograms, one meter in one second. In honor of James Watt, the German-British engineer C. William Siemens proposed in 1882 that the rate of energy transfer over a unit of time should be called a watt. Watt's invention, along with those of others, were adapted for use in paper mills, cotton textile manufacturing, locomotives, and steamboats. A pioneer in adapting the steam engine to power a boat was American inventor John Fitch in 1787. Fitch attached a steam engine to a bank of oars to paddle the boat. Unfortunately, it proved too expensive for practical use. Samuel Morey invented a steam-powered paddle wheel but he lacked financial backing. In 1806, Robert Fulton invented the first successful steamboat with a circular wooden paddle wheel. Ronald Reagan commented May 20th, 1986, when steam-powered vessels began to eclipse sailing ships in the latter part of the 19th century, it was largely the result of pioneering work by two Americans, John Fitch and Robert Fulton. 
As a young man, Robert Fulton met inventor Benjamin Franklin. In fact, Franklin had written on using steam to propel boats and supported the earlier inventor, James Rumsey, in his attempt to develop steam-powered jet propulsion. Robert Fulton went to France, where he developed the first practical submarine and made steamboat advances. Fulton secured the financial backing of Robert Livingston of New York, who was a founding father on the committee with Jefferson to draft the Declaration of Independence and who helped negotiate the Louisiana Purchase. Robert Fulton presented his submarine and steamboat ideas to Napoleon, but he was uninterested. Livingston secured a monopoly on steamboat navigation in the state of New York. With Livingston's support, Robert Fulton built the first commercial steamboat, the Clermont. It used a 24-horsepower steam engine built by James Watt. In 1807, the Claremont carried 60 passengers 150 miles from New York City to the state capital of Albany in just 32 hours. Hans Christian Andersen wrote in The Thorny Road to, of Honor, 1856, We are in America, on the margin of one of the largest rivers, an innumerable crowd has gathered, for it is said that a ship is to sail against the wind and weather. The man who thinks he can solve this problem is named Robert Fulton. Hans Christian Andersen continued, the ship begins its passage, but suddenly stops. The crowd begins to laugh. Then suddenly the wheels turn again. The ship continues its course between the builder of the bridge and the earth, between providence and the human race. Called the father of steam navigation, Robert Fulton wrote about the Clermont's first trip from New York City to Albany on August 7, 1807. The power of propelling boats by steam is now fully proved. The morning I left New York, there were not perhaps 30 persons in the city who believed that the boat would ever move one mile an hour or be of the least utility. And while we were putting off from the wharf, which was crowded with spectators, I heard a number of sarcastic remarks. Fulton continued, It was the early autumn of the year 1807 that a knot of villagers was gathered on a high bluff just opposite Poughkeepsie on the west bank of the Hudson, attracted by the appearance of a strange dark-looking craft which was slowly making its way up the river. Some imagined it to be a sea monster, while others did not hesitate to express their belief that it was a sign of the approaching judgment. What seemed strange in the vessel was the lofty and straight black smoke pipes rising from the deck instead of the gracefully tapered masts. The working beam and pistons and the slow turning and the splashing of the huge and naked paddle wheels met the astonished gaze. The dense clouds of smoke, as they rose wave upon wave, added still more to the wonderment of the rustics. When the War of 1812 broke out with Britain, Fulton designed a military steamboat, but the war ended February 17, 1815, before it was put into use. Fulton died a week later at the age of 49. His statue was placed in the U.S. Capitol Statuary Hall, by the state of Pennsylvania in 1889. Reagan stated, June 11th, 1981, the future has always looked bleak till people with brains and faith found a way to make it better. People like Robert Fulton. Two years after Fulton's steamboat, Colonel John Stevens launched a low pressure side wheel steamboat in 1809, which was the first steamboat to sail on the open ocean. On May 22, 1819, the SS Savannah, a hybrid sailing ship side wheel steamer, left Savannah, Georgia, and 25 days later arrived in Liverpool, England, completing the first transatlantic -Atlant trans voyage by steamship. In 1836, Swedish inventor John Ericsson was living in England. He invented and patented a screw propeller, which was a significant improvement over the paddle wheel for steamship propulsion. 
propellers were also less vulnerable to being damaged in battle. Ericsson demonstrated his propeller-driven steamship to the British Navy, but they passed on it, choosing an invention by Francis Petit Smith. But Britain's loss was America's gain. In 1839, the U.S. Navy captain, Robert Stockton, whose grandfather signed the Declaration of Independence, invited John Erickson to come to America. Stockton was known for being the first naval officer to act against the slave trade and for helping to found Liberia. Once in America, John Erickson designed the sloop USS Princeton with its twin steam-driven screw propellers completely submerged underwater at the rear of the boat. The USS Princeton was launched in 1843 and won speed trials over steam paddle boats, making it the fastest steamer afloat. Unfortunately, during a demonstration in 1844, a faulty cannon exploded, killing the Secretary of the Navy and the Secretary of State. Providentially, President John Tyler was safely below deck. In 1845, nine years after the Battle of the Alamo, Robert Stockton served as Navy Commodore during the Mexican-American War. He sailed the USS Princeton to Galveston, Texas, with President James Polk's offer to annex the state for the U.S., Fort Stockton, Texas is named for him. Stockton is most remembered for sailing a fleet in 1846 to California on his flagship USS Congress. He captured California and sent word by land back to Washington, D.C., carried by Kit Carson. Stockton, California is named for him. John Erickson continued making naval innovations, such as a boilerless hot air caloric engine, modified from Reverend Robert Sterling's engine. Erickson launched a submarine boat, the first self-propelled torpedo and the first torpedo boat. He presented a design for an ironclad armored battleship to Francis Napoleon III in 1854, but he did not pursue it. Using Erickson's invention of a steam-powered screw propeller, the USS Merrimack was launched in 1855 in Boston's Navy Yard. It also had masts and sails to conserve on coal, which was needed to burn and make steam. It was named after the Merrimack River that flows through New Hampshire and Massachusetts. The USS Merrimack sailed to the Caribbean, then to Southampton, England, then to Brest in northwest France, then to Lives in Portugal, and then to Toulon in southern France. In 1857, it sailed around Cape Horn, South America, and cruised the Pacific coast of South and Central America. In 1860, the USS Merrimack was decommissioned for repairs in Norfolk, Virginia. When the Civil War started, a Union naval officer tried to get the USS Merrimack out of the Norfolk Harbor, but sunken ships blocked the way. To prevent it from being captured by the Confederacy, the Union officer partially burned and sank the Merrimack. The Confederate Navy, desperate for ships, salvaged the USS Merrimack from the water, repaired it, transforming it into an ironclad, with its hull and deck covered with iron plates and a 14-gun ports with iron shutters. The Confederate Navy renamed it the CSS Virginia, though many still referred to it as the Merrimack. The Union Navy blockaded the James River where it entered the Chesapeake Bay, thus cutting off Virginia's largest cities, Richmond and Norfolk, from international trade. On the morning of March 8, 1862, the Battle of Hampton Roads began. The Confederate iron-plated CSS Virginia the Merrimack, attacked, destroying numerous vessels, including two Union boats, the USS Congress, the USS Cumberland, and running a third aground in shallow water, the USS Minnesota. The next day, the CSS Virginia, or Merrimack, sailed out to continue its attacks, but during the night, the Union had the ironclad USS Monitor 
sail into the waters of Hampton Roads. The USS Monitor was designed by John Erickson, who had presented plans for it to the U.S. Navy in 1861, based on the dimensions of a Swedish lumber raft. It had a revolving gun turret designed by American inventor Theodore Timby. Dedicating a memorial to John Erickson, one block south of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., President Calvin Coolidge stated May 29, 1926, the Confederate ironclad Merrimack began a work of destruction among 16 federal vessels carrying 298 guns. When the ironclad Merrimack went out on the morning of March 9th to complete its work of destruction, it was at once surprised and challenged by this new and extraordinary naval innovation. After a battle lasting four hours, in which the Monitor suffered no material damage, the Merrimack, badly crippled, withdrew never to venture out again. The London Times stated that the day before the battle, England had 149 first-class warships. The day after, she had but two, and they were iron-plated only amidship. Naval warfare had been revolutionized. Coolidge continued his dedication of the John Erickson Memorial with 5,000 people assembled, including Sweden's Crown Prince Gustav Adolf. We assemble here today to do reverence to the memory of a great son of Sweden, John Erickson. We honor him most of all because we can truly say that he was a great American. When offered payment for designing the monitor, John Erickson, who had a particular horror of slavery, replied to a U.S. Senator in 1882, nothing could induce me to accept any remuneration from the United States for the monitor. It was my contribution to the glorious cause, the glorious union cause, which freed four million bondsmen. In Battery Park, New York, a bronze portrait of John Erickson was dedicated in 1893 and a statue in 1903 with the plaque. The city of New York erects this statue to the memory of a citizen whose genius has contributed to the greatness of the Republic and the progress of the world, John Erickson was born in Langbashitan, Sweden, July 31st, 1803, died in New York, March 8th, 1889. Considered one of the greatest mechanical engineers in history, a monument dedicated to him is in Nybrokikaven, Stockholm. The United States issued a postage stamp honoring John Erickson in 1926, a memorial erected to John Erickson and the monitor in Monsignor Magolik Park in Brooklyn, New York in 1939, stated, erected by the people of the state of New York to commemorate the Battle of the Monitor and Merrimack, March 9th, 1862, and in memory of the men of the monitor and its designer, John Erickson. President Coolidge concluded his tribute to John Erickson. The great mechanical genius wrote to President Lincoln offering to construct a vessel for the destruction of the hostile fleet in Norfolk and for scourging southern rivers and inlets of all craft protecting southern batteries. John Erickson explained to President Lincoln, who was dedicated to ending slavery, attachment to the Union alone impels me to offer my services at this frightful crisis, my life, if need be, in which the great cause which Providence has caused you to defend. Erickson said, I love this country. I love its people and its laws, and I would give my life for it. President Franklin Roosevelt paid tribute to the American Merchant Marine by designating May 22, 1933 as National Maritime Day. On National Maritime Day in Washington, D.C., 2012, Reverend Canon James D. Von Driel, Vice President of the North American Maritime Ministry Association, stated, I'm honored once again to make a presentation at the observance of the 2012 National Maritime Day. Not a ship in ancient times was launched or set out on a voyage without proper prayers. The Bible is filled with sailing images and some of Jesus' disciples were fishermen. Reverend Von Driel continued, seafarers look for special blessings for their ship from the church. The launching of, uh, of new builds 
requires a minister to bless the ship. Maritime ministry got its start in America in the early 1800s. Earnest church clergy and laity formed missions in Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, the prime ports of this nation. nation. Their prime concerns were the religious, moral, and physical well-being of the seafarers. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of How We Got Here on Maritime History. God bless you.